friends, welcome back to the Brook Willow Knit channel. My name is Anna, and today we have yet another knitting crafty podcast. Um, I haven't really been inspired or in the mood to do cool vlogs or any other type of videos lately. I think I've just been putting all of my creative energy into my projects and um, now that it's getting nice outside I'm spending a lot more time outdoors and kind of being social again so that's why we have another podcast but it seems that people like the podcast the most so I think it's a win for everybody. So without further ado let's just get on into things. Um, I don't have any new finished knit objects this week and we'll get into that a little bit but I do have a new finished modified knit object and if you follow me on Instagram you may already know what this is going to be but it sure I sure wasn't expecting the carpet coat to make an entrance back into the podcast and I'm sure you weren't either um, so if you've been following along for a while, this is one of my biggest knit pieces I've ever made. It was something I was working on when I first started this channel, and it's definitely gone through a journey. So this is the Carpet Coat by Kay Facet from the Glorious Knits book, which came out in like 1989. And it's out of print now, but I think you can still get copies of it from like thriftbooks.com or any other secondhand bookstore. I highly recommend it because there are so many wonderful patterns in there and there's definitely more that I want to make in the future. But I made this one and first when I made it, the needles were too big and it came out way too long and... I don't know what I was thinking, but it just wasn't really working out. So I ripped the whole thing out and I started it over and made it again. And it definitely was better the second time. However, it still just was way too big to be able to wear out in public um, or anywhere that I'm walking around. Cause it was just heavy and it was the size of a Snuggie and that's really all it ended up being used as was like a big blanket with sleeves that I would wear on my couch. Um, but I just really was kind of sad that I wasn't able to wear it in public because it's such a beautiful piece and I really wanted to show it off. So I was listening to Casey from Young Folk Knits and Becky from A Hand Knit Letter. They have a new audio podcast out. Um, and I listened to the first episode where they were talking about felting garments and I think someone had asked them if they felt garments or anything and they both were like, no, definitely not. It's kind of scary. And for some reason I had the idea in my head, like maybe I should felt the carpet coat. I just think in the exact opposite of what they were saying. And so when I got home from work that day, I decided to test it out because it was so large that I knew it wasn't going to shrink to a size where I wasn't going to be wearing it anymore. So I was able to do that and it worked out lovely. Um, it's interesting because I used all different types of yarn in here and the yarn that had a little bit of acrylic content in it, like unsurprisingly did not felt. So the collar, the sleeve cuffs and some bits throughout here and I'm actually kind of happy that those spots maintained a ribbing type structure because I don't know I feel like if that part felt it it would be kind of weird but the Malabrigo bits like this color this green um, and even this this isn't Malabrigo but all of the 100% wool did felt really nicely and evenly and I just Threw it in the washer and dryer. I think I used 
like medium heat for water and high heat in the dryer and I only had to do it for one cycle and it worked out really great and I took a picture of that and posted it on my Instagram and a lot of people said that they wanted to see me try it on um, when I tried it on after felting it still was a little big um, in the hip area it had so much like bulbous extra fabric and it just gave my body like a shape that just didn't feel like me and it, it felt like it still needed a little bit of work so I decided um, to maybe eliminate some fabric from those sides by sewing like folding it in where I wanted to take the fabric out sewing it with um, a zigzag stitch on my sewing machine multiple times and then cutting the bits out it was challenging on the machine because the fabric is so thick um, and I did break a needle um, but eventually I was able to get all of the pieces sewn together that I wanted to cut out. So it ended up being two big rectangles. These are the bits that I cut out. Um, and that took out quite a bit of fabric. It's kind of cool. These are like the structural integrity of these are so amazing because of the felting. Like even without stitches being in this, this fabric isn't going anywhere so I kind of want to reuse this fabric somehow I don't really know how yet just because I spent the time to knit it up and it has beautiful yarns in it so I don't want to just throw it away um, so I'm gonna keep these for a later date and maybe I'll think of something to make out of these I kind of want to make some kind of dog accessory so my dogs can match me when I wear this coat, but I don't know. Anyways, that did the trick. This coat is so much more wearable. I'll put in a clip here of me wearing it, um, but I'm just beyond happy. I get to wear this out in public. I actually went to a bluegrass festival with my friends yesterday and it was like an outdoor indoor type event and I got to wear this coat and it was kind of the perfect setting for it because it was cloudy and gloomy and like 38 degrees so it was pretty cold um, and this just was the perfect piece and I got so many compliments on it and oh I'm just more than happy to be able to actually go out and wear this and I think it's going to make a great piece for when I go camping and definitely in the fall time this is like such a fall vibe and yeah so I just had to show this off because it was definitely a win even though it was a very scary thing to do not only felting but also cutting fabric out into a big knit garment and it all turned out for the best. So yeah, just thought I would share that one. So moving into works in progress, I have been mostly just working on this sweater here. And this is the Flower Power Pullover by Deegan. I think the last time I showed it to you, I just had the two front panel, or the front panel and the back panel done. But as you can see here, I have completed the neckline. I have one whole sleeve done and seamed up. I'm just working on the second sleeve here. So I definitely think I'll be able to finish this this week. I really wanted to focus on getting this one done because as we all know, the cold weather is coming to an end and it'll soon be summer, but here in Wisconsin, it's still been pretty cold, um, 40s, 30s and 40s all week. And I think if I finish this in time, I can still be able to wear it at least once before spring summer weather fully hits. Um, so that's why I've just been trucking away on it. It's been going pretty good. If you've watched before, you know that this is 
um, Biche Bouche Le Petit Lamb's Wool in the color reddish brown and very light green. This is the yarn that was recommended for the pattern and used in the sample. It is, the yarn itself is a very light fingering weight, but it is held double throughout the sweater. When I first bought the yarn, I think I had to do like seven skeins. It was like seven or nine skeins of the reddish brown and then two of the green. And I was really nervous knowing that I was holding it double, um, that I was going to run out of yarn. But now I think I'm going to actually have yarn left over. I think I might have a whole skein of this that I won't need to break into and an equivalent to a whole skein of this, even though this is already caked up. Um, really like working with the yarn. Um, the construction itself is kind of a combination of intarsia and stranded color work. In the pattern, I don't think it's giving away too much, but it's recommended to work with bobbins and multiple skeins of yarn, but I actually found it's easier to work with just two balls of the very light green and one of the reddish brown and I just carry the floats back and forth. It's so much easier for yarn management. There isn't any puckering in the color work. At the end of each color work section, I would kind of just like spread out the yarn to have it lay flat if it was bubbling up a little bit and that seemed to really do the trick. I did have a little bit of trouble with the neckline, which you're probably thinking why, that looks like the easiest neck. Um, but it's because I just moved right into the neck and I forgot to go down. So the bodies worked in US 7, I forgot to go down to US 5 needles. And then I did originally Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off for the neckline and it just gave a really floppy neckline. Most of that being because I used the size 7 to do the ribbing, but also the surprisingly stretchy bind off is really nice. I use it a lot um, in socks, but at the neck it just felt a little unfinished, especially because the pattern calls for Italian sewn bind off on the sleeve cuffs and tubular cast on for the bottom hem. Um, so I kind of wanted to just mirror that with a neckline and I decided to do a tubular bind off because it's still super stretchy, but it gives that really clean edge. I think I might be one of the rare people who actually enjoys doing sewn bind offs. I could do it for an entire body and be perfectly happy. I don't know if it's just the motion with the needle going through the stitches, it's very rhythmic, but I genuinely enjoy it. And the result it gives is just really clean and nice. And I've gotten to a point where I kind of just do it on all garments that don't have an I cord edging on it. But yeah, so ripped it out, recast the neckline back on with the smaller needles and the new cast off. And I think it's going to be super nice. So very happy with how this one is turning out. I know in my last episode I went on and on about how much I love this motif and still do and I'm excited to wear it. So yeah, Flower Power Pullover by Deacon. I don't know if anybody else is struggling with this but I've had the worst seasonal allergies I think of my entire life this season, so much so that I like had to take a COVID test because I'm like, there's no way this is just allergies. I kind of heard with age, if you have seasonal allergies, they they just get worse with age. Um, and this year is no exception to that. <laughs> I am resisting touching my face. I made sure to take my allergy pill two hours before recording this so I wasn't all stuffed up. So I hope it's not intervening with the video in any kind of way. Let's move on. Um, this almost isn't even worth showing because like I said, I've been working on the flower power pullover 
for knitting mostly, but I have made some progress on the June Top by Petite Knit. So this is as far as I got with the body. The last time I showed it, it was just basically a cast on, but I'm excited to get back into working with this after I finish the other sweater because this also isn't really meant for super warm weather because of the yarn that I use, which is Pearl Soho's Cashmere Merino Bloom. I originally bought this on Black Friday thinking that I would make this more in the winter time and wear it as just like a layering tank top underneath a blazer or a flannel or another sweater or whatever, but I want to pump this out so I can still get some use before summer hits. I know I'll have next year to wear it, but I am just loving this hydrangea color so much that I just want to be able to wear it. <laughs> so this is where I'm at with that. Um, who knows, maybe the next time we chat I will have it complete because the June top does knit up super quick since it's just stock a net in the round and then you just separate for the straps. But yep, there we go. That's the only knitting I've been working on currently since I made that rule for myself last episode that I'm not casting on any new projects until I finish two. So I can finish two projects and cast on one. But I think I made an exception to that rule because I don't think I technically said anything about crochet. As we know, I was working on the striped lumbar pillow in the last episode and then I just stopped working on that. Um, I still love the pattern, I really want the product, but I also have just had this desire to knit and crochet lace work. I don't know, it just feels right this time of year. I'm just in a lacy mood. So this is a pattern that I had picked out for a while and um, it's for a blanket. So I'll go ahead and show you this. So this is crochet and I'll get up and show you closer. It's a little hard to tell the stitch pattern, but if you go to my Instagram, you can see a closer up photo of it and the stitch definition is very defined. This pattern is the Zetwall Throw by DeBras, which is the same pattern designer that I used for the lumbar pillow that I'm making. Um, I think she has like buy to get one free patterns on her website, which is why I am just going with the same designer. And I really liked the stitch pattern. And I have another one for a bag that I'll eventually make, but I think I need to finish at least one of these crochet projects before I cast on a whole other crochet project. Um, but yeah, so the story with this blanket is, A, I wanted to make a blanket um, whether it be knit or quilted or crochet, I just want to kind of update the blankets that I have in my house. I have some older blankets, um, some that I probably just need to donate, and now that I have my new house, well I guess it's not new anymore, it's been almost a year since we bought it, but I just, I haven't made any blankets that kind of go with my decor. So I thought this would be really fun and I don't know about you, but I always like to have something over my lap, whether it be in the winter or even in the summer. I just like having something covering me, especially because I set up my chaise lounge out on our front porch and it's just nice to have something over you. But in the summer, I don't necessarily want a wool blanket across my lap. So I thought it would be kind of fun to make a summertime throw. And of course I can achieve that by not using wool. And instead I am using linen. It's like cotton linen. So I picked up this Patton's cotton linen blend yarn at Joanne Fabrics. I was just perusing because I was bored and I don't know 
happened to pass by Joann's. And I saw this. They had so many beautiful colors, so I couldn't resist buying it. At first, I, I didn't even know what I wanted to make with it yet. I knew I wanted to crochet something, and I was kind of thinking of crocheting a tank top. Um, so I picked up four balls of this, but I didn't really end up finding any tank top patterns that I wanted. And I decided this was in the color family that I wanted to make a blanket in in the first place. So I decided to make a blanket with it. Um, so as I said, it's Patton's linen. It's 65% cotton and 35% linen, which is just the perfect summertime blend. And this colorway is sage. I'm going to have to buy a lot more of these because this is one ball of yarn and <laughs> I think four balls which is what I bought isn't gonna do the trick it's only gonna make it be like this big so I'm probably gonna have to buy I don't know like eight twelve more balls we'll see I might just buy a little bit at a time unless I have to buy it online um, but yeah I am making the throw size that's listed so it's not gonna be like a queen size blanket or anything just something nice to throw over my lap um, so yeah definitely gonna have to buy more yarn but this has been bringing me a lot of joy it's just one row you do one type of stitch and the second row you do another type of stitch and it's very easy to memorize a lot of people are like wow that looks so complicated it's not I am very much a beginner crocheter and this is so easy to crochet. I absolutely love this star pattern. To me, it's the perfect TV mindless knit or crochet, I should say, because it's a little more interesting than stockinette. It keeps you engaged, but it's so repetitive and very easy. Um, so this has been my to-go project that I keep in my purse. I know there's going to be a point in time when it gets to be more of a blanket size that it might not be as easy to travel with on the go, but for now it is doing the trick. Um, so yeah, that's the crochet project I've been working on. I have been doing a bit more spinning. I kind of just want to get all of the yarn spun up for the night shift shawl that I've been talking about for the last like eight months <laughs> and that I've been spinning for for like the last eight months. Um, so a couple videos ago I did a little Q&A spin and chat where I started I think it was the January colorway of Hello Yarns subscription and I finally finished it. So here is the skein all plied up. Um, I am doing a three ply and just like the rest of the skeins. I haven't washed this yet. I think I'm going to just kind of wait until I spin up the rest of the skeins and wash them, not necessarily together, but wash them all at the same time. Um, and that way I can keep a better track of what I've washed and what I haven't washed. So yeah, I'm going to show you this closer because it's so beautiful. As you can tell, it's mostly purple, very purple heavy, but there are little bits of olive green and even black running through it, which just give it a bit more of dimension. And I think it's just gonna go so well in the night shift shawl. So yeah, happy with this. I'm gonna keep on trucking. I just have two more skeins to spin up and then I have all of the yarn I need for that shawl. However, I'm not allowed to cast on that shawl until I finished the Soda Bosk shawl that I started last September. Um, but it'll be nice. I think it'll be motivation to finally finish that shawl when I have this all spun up and ready to go to cast on. Um, I think I'll stop dragging my feet on it. So, yeah. Um, I... 
have a finished sewing object, which I showed you as a whip in the last episode. And that is the Nepheline blouse by Vivienne Shaw. Here she is in all her glory. I love it so much. So the story behind this is I, well, Kevin ripped a hole in my bed sheets, my 100% linen bed sheets, and I didn't want that fabric to just go to waste, so I was able to salvage all of the surrounding pieces of bed sheet and turn it into this lovely blouse, which I love so much. I think this is the hardest thing I've ever made. Um, and most of that has to do with this neckline here. I don't know if you can see it super well, but yeah, it's like super ruffly. And I've done gathering before and ruffle bits before, but this one, just was on another level. And then it's the first time I did pin tucking on the sleeves here, which is actually super easy to do. And then I have done buttons before, but they just take some time to get on there. I use some kind of faux shell-like buttons. that I picked up from Joanne Fabrics. Now, there's another little element to this blouse, and I don't know if you can tell right here, but there was actually a little hole in it that I noticed after I had already cut out the fabric, and I didn't really wanna go and try to cut out another whole piece. I used that to my advantage and decided to do a little bit of visible mending in the form of embroidery. And so this blouse is very romantic with the ruffles and the sleeves. So I wanted to use kind of a romantic type of flower to embroider and what is more romantic than a rose. Um, and I, I didn't want to use a color because I didn't want it to be like a bright, color. I wanted it to be very tonal and I decided to just use white embroidery thread. So I'll get up and show you that rose a little bit closer. I was very fortunate that the hole was in a nice location exactly where like a Ralph Lauren little embroidery or any other type of brand would be. So it looks just very intentional um, and I just looked up a free YouTube tutorial on how to do the rosette which was super easy and then I just kind of free handed the little leaves around it but I think it gives it a really cute little touch to the blouse and I'll try it on and show you a video of it here it fits lovely exactly how I wanted it to fit um, what size did I make this in? I want to say I did a size 6. My measurements were right in between a size 5 and a size 6. And I knew I wanted it to be more oversized than not. So I went up to the size 6 and I'm really happy with that decision because I love the way it fits. <laughs> And yes, so this is linen fabric. And I think since it's so flowy, it's gonna be really nice to wear well into the summer. If it gets really hot, I think it'd be cute with just like a pair of denim shorts or something, like linen shorts, I don't know. But I can see myself getting a lot of use out of this. So if you're a sewist and you're looking for a new blouse pattern, I highly recommend this. I think Vivian's pattern writing is so easy to follow. I'm not going to lie. I think it was the easiest pattern to follow while at the same time being the hardest thing I ever made, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I definitely would make more of her patterns going forward. I don't really have a ton of other things to show. I, like I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, I've been a bit more social, a little more busy outside. I have 
big plans for gardening this year. Last summer, I didn't um, really focus anything, any of my energy on landscaping because it really took us almost all summer to move into the house and I was just kind of focused on getting things ready inside. Um, and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna worry about landscaping next year. But I do have really big plans for my yard that I eventually want to walk you through it once we get to a point where we can start planting. Here, I'm in zone 4B if anyone's interested to know. Um, and we can't really plant anything into the ground until after Mother's Day. So I still have a little bit of time, but it's kind of helped because I've been able to plant a lot and I started seeds and all of that. But yeah, I am really excited. So I'm breaking my different sections of the yard up into four different quadrants for the types of gardening that I'm going to do. So in the front yard, I want it to be more ornamental, colorful flowers. My house is painted pure white, not even cream, not off-white, it's pure white. So I really want to accent that with just the most colorful flowers that I can have. Um, so we had these overgrown bushes in our front yard, which created really nice um, privacy for our front porch. We have a big front porch that's the entire width of the house, and I absolutely love it. But the, the bushes just looked a little junky. So I ended up digging them out a couple weeks ago, which I think kind of was the catalyst to my allergies, to be honest. But that was hard work. I don't know if anyone's ever dug out a bush, especially one that's been there for decades, I would guess. But um, I had to use a hatchet and a shovel and it took a long time. It was a great workout, but I was able to get that thing out. And each root ball, there was two, was 60 pounds. It was so hard to drag it to my backyard. Um, but I'm so excited. I'm going to replace that bush with a smoke bush, uh, more specifically a velvet fog smoke bush. This is something, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Madeline Island. It's part of the Apostle Islands on Lake Superior in northern Wisconsin. It's a beautiful place. You take a ferry to it. And I, I've been there camping twice, but in their little downtown area, there's this candle shop that's, it was like a big white house and they have this massive smoke bush and when Mitch and I first went there I was just blown away by this bush. I have never seen anything like it before. It's not really a common bush around where I live but it is still hardy for this zone. It's available in zones four through eight. Um, and so I knew once we bought this white house I'm like we have to do the smoke bush because it just means so much to me. So I bought the bush. I have it just in a pot inside for now. I'm too scared to plant it outside because our weather's been all over the place. We had um, 80 degree weather and then it snowed like a few inches and now it's more just like true spring weather with like 30s and 40s, cloudy and rainy. So I'm just waiting a little bit to plant it. It said you can plant it in early spring, but um, I don't know, I'm just nervous. I don't want it to die or get frost or whatever. And then next to that bush, I have seeds from my grandma's hollyhocks that she had at her house. She passed away a few years ago, but before that she gave seeds to my sister and my sister still had seeds left over and she gave them to me. So I'm gonna have beautiful, colorful hollyhocks right next to the smoke bush and they pair well nicely together too. Um, and then I'm gonna do hanging planters and then the following year I'm really gonna expand the garden in the front yard to be even more ornamental, beautiful flowers. Um, I have been obsessed with the show Gardener's World. It's a I think it's a BBC production and the main host is Monty Don, who I have a huge crush on. Um, and he also has two golden retrievers that are always just playing around in the backyard and I just love it. If you watch that show, let me know. It's like perfect. It's really good napping 
TV, but also it really inspired me for gardening this year. So yeah, that's the front yard. And then on this side of the house, which is north, no, south facing, so it gets full sun, I'm gonna do wildflowers all along the side of the house. And then the big mammoth sunflowers as well. And it'll be nice because they'll be against the side of the house, so that will protect it from the wind since, you know, they get so big and leggy. Um, and then on the other side, so behind you, <laughs> is the shady side of the house. And there's big trees on that side. And I'm going to do like a shady hosta fern garden. There's already a few hostas and ferns on one side of our little walking path. But on the other side, I'm really going to fill that whole space out with shady plants. And the cool thing is... My grandpa on the other side of my family, who passed away 10 years ago, he had all of these hostas in his yard. And someone that I worked with was doing work at his house one day, back when he was alive. And he took cuttings of that hosta and planted it at his house. And then I didn't even know about this. But then when I bought my house as like a housewarming gift, he gave me cuttings of those hostas. So I have my grandpa's hostas from when he lived, you know, over 10 years ago. So I have plants from both of my grandparents at my house and I don't know, it feels really special. And then that just leaves the backyard. I ended up getting two raised planters and I'm gonna grow my own vegetables back there and the previous owners left these huge planters behind that are really nice and I think I'm gonna do um, all of my herbs in those. So that's all my plans for planting. I feel like it's really going to impede in on my knitting, crochet, sewing time, but I'm excited. It's fun to switch things up and I know that was a super long tangent into gardening that no one was expecting but yeah if you're interested in that I definitely can talk more about my journey and maybe do some like videos of how the progress is going. I know Taylor E. Owen really does that a lot in her videos and I just love watching how her garden is just progressing over time. It's fun. And then um, I've also been getting back into my piano practice. You may have noticed in photos or maybe even videos that I have a piano. I took lessons from the age, I don't know, I was like second or third grade all the way through high school. And I played a little bit after that, but I really kind of fell off the boat lately. But I kind of miss just playing piano. And so I've been getting really into that lately. And if you are an Apple Music person, I really highly recommend. Um, they came out with an entire app just for classical. And if you're an Apple Music subscriber, you get that for free. And they have this whole um, series called The Story of Classical. And what it does is it breaks all of the classical music up into the periods. So, for example, there's like the Baroque era, the Classical era, the Romantic era, and so on. Um, and there's this guy that talks about all of the prominent composers of each era and what the kind of attributes attributes are to each era. And it's been so educational. He describes it as a crash course in classical music. And I have been finding it so inspirational. Um, he kind of like goes through the whole spiel and you get little clippings of each composer's music and what he's talking about. And then at the end of his little session on each era it just goes through and plays all of those songs at length so that's something that i've been listening to a lot when i'm spinning sewing or just cleaning too and i'm enjoying it so much i never really got that kind of education 
when I was taking piano lessons, I really just was taught how to play the piano and I obviously knew who these composers were, but I couldn't exactly pinpoint what era they were in or what kind of characteristics there were of each era. And so I've been really loving that. And if you're interested in classical music and you have Apple Music, you really should check it out because I've been loving it so much. Um, so there's that. And then I, I finished Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which I was listening to as an audiobook. That was an amazing story. I know it's, I think it just recently came out and it's super popular. Like a ton of people are reading it and I highly recommend it. It was kind of a slow going book, but I like books that are a bit slow going sometimes. I think there's definitely a time and a place. But now I am listening to a book called, um, oh shoot, what is it called? One moment. A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. It was Maggie from the Sonder Knitting Podcast that recommended this book. And so I decided to read it because she recommended another book that I listened to that I really love. So I trust her opinions. Um, but it's super cute. I'm just in the beginnings of it. It's only a four hour listen, which is really quick um, in my opinion, but basically about a person and a robot who meet and have this unlikely friendship or whatever. That's where I'm at in the story so far, but I really like it. It's kind of like the post-apocalyptic timeline, which I find really fascinating. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm listening to right now. So yeah, that was a bit of a ramble, but I figured I could since I didn't really have a ton to show. Um, but it was nice to sit down and chat with everybody. I'm actually heading out to go to a going away party for some friends that are moving down to Atlanta. Um, and then I'll probably just come home and do some knitting. But it's nice to chat with you all per usual. If you like what you see here, please give it a fun thumbs up. <laughs> that really helps me. And if you're new here, welcome. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. But I hope you all had a great weekend and we'll chat next time. Bye!